Chairman Boxer, Ranking Member Vitter, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important topic. The social cost of carbon is a concept that was developed in the academic literature on the economics of climate change. So far, it's been used to help justify over 35 federal regulations, where sometimes more than 20 percent of the alleged benefits of these regulations are derived from the social cost of carbon. Now, as I will explain, the administration's calculation or estimate of the social cost of carbon is malleable and arbitrary and therefore not appropriate for the federal government to use to justify regulations. A large fraction of the alleged benefits from reducing carbon dioxide emissions are incredibly speculative as they occur in 50, 100, or even 250 years in the future. As I will explain, the estimated size of the social cost of carbon is heavily dependent on the discount rate that's used in the analysis, and the administration on this point has ignored OMB's guidance. In fact, this concept is so open-ended that we can generate estimated social costs of carbon that are very high, or close to zero, or even negative, just by adjusting some key parameters. What this means is that the economist can produce just about any estimate of the social cost of carbon desired. Now, in theory, the social cost of carbon quantifies in dollar terms the damages from emitting an additional unit of carbon dioxide because of its presumed acceleration of future climate change. As I've said, it's been used to help justify policies, such as imposing stricter fuel economy standards by giving quantifiable benefits in dollar terms from these policies' impact on emissions. The social cost of carbon has been in the news lately because just recently in May, the administration's working group, without public comment or notice, dramatically increased its headline estimate of the current social cost of carbon by around 50 percent from its previous estimate that was made back in 2010. Back then, it estimated about $22 per ton of CO2, and then now it bumped it up to $33 a ton just in May. Now, to understand where these numbers come from, let me briefly explain how the working group generates its figures. First, they selected three popular models, computer models from the literature of the global economic and climate system, and then they used those models to run thousands of simulations through the year 2300. Now, what may surprise you is in these computer simulations chosen by the working group, under certain scenarios, carbon dioxide emitted today can sometimes produce net benefits to humanity because, just for example, modest warming can boost agricultural productivity, reduce cold-related deaths in the winter, and lower heating bills. But eventually, in these models, uh, they assume that an extra ton of emissions today will start producing net damages. The social cost of carbon, then, is an estimate of that flow of possible upfront benefits, then followed by a flow of damages through the year 2300. So given this setup of how they compute this number, the discount, raise that we, discount rate that we use in the analysis will have a huge impact. Just to give you an example, the working groups may estimate the current social cost of carbon is only $11 per ton if we use a 5% discount rate, but it's $52 a ton if we use a 2.5% discount rate. So I want to stress that this range in the estimate from $11 a ton up to $52 a ton, that has nothing to do with the climate science. That range itself is driven entirely by just changing the discount rate from 5% down to 2.5%. So you can see in this context how important that choice of dis discount rate is. And on this matter, it's relevant that the working group explicitly disregarded OMB's clear guidance that when providing cost-benefit analyses of federal regulations, one of the estimates should be computed with a discount rate of 7%. Now, without seeing the actual underlying data, we can't know for sure what the results would have been from the working group's analysis had they reported it at 7 percent, but it would probably have produced a social cost of carbon, again, following all their other procedures and just reporting it using 7 percent, a social cost of carbon close to zero, in which case the administration's rationale for limiting emissions would collapse. OMB also required that cost-benefit analysis be conducted in terms of domestic impacts, with the global impacts merely being optional. Yet again, the working group disregarded this clear guidance and just reported the global figure. Just to give you an example of the impact of that uh, choice, the recent headline figure from the May report of $33 a ton is a global figure. Had they reported just the domestic social cost of carbon, it could have been as low as $2 per ton using the working group's own range of adjustment factors to go from global to domestic. So in summary, the social cost of carbon is not an objective feature of the world that's out there that we're waiting for economists to go measure and then give feedback to policymakers. Rather, it's generated within computer simulations that make projections centuries into the future. 
Even more troubling, the working group disregarded two OMB guidelines on how to compute and report these figures. Clearly, federal policy should not be formed on the basis of such a dubious concept. Thank you.